So much is known about our 32nd president, Franklin Roosevelt, that we decided to dig up a little information on him you might not know. And what better place to do just that than here in Hyde Park at the FDR Presidential Library and Museum. One element of FDR's life that is often overlooked is the fact that he was disabled, his life changing forever off the coast of New Brunswick in 1921. He was going to go up to Campobello to vacation with the family um, in August, but he first had an obligation, and that was to stop at the Bear Mountain Boy Scout camp and the Boy Scout Jamboree going on there because he was a great supporter of the Boy Scouts. That is where we think he contracted the polio virus. It incubated in him until he got to Campobello, and on August 10, 1921, he took his last steps. He retired to his upstairs bedroom, very tired, very uh, feeling very sick. The next morning, he couldn't walk because he was such a public figure at the time, having just run for vice president. Um, his political advisor, Louis Howe, helped secret him out of, of uh, uh, Campobello because they didn't want the press to know how serious the virus had, had overtaken him. At one point, FDR couldn't move from the neck down. But Roosevelt had too much fighting spirit to let this derail his political ambitions. He went through a, a very vigorous exercise regimen um, at the Roosevelt home here in Hyde Park. They had um, all sorts of equipment built on the lawn and he would go out there and, and exercise on parallel bars and lift himself up and that type of thing. The other thing he did to, to exercise his upper body was the half mile or so from the home to the post road, which was the, the main entry road, uh, when he was rehabilitating he would, he would get his crutches and he would literally drag himself the distance to the, to the gate and back um, as a way to, to exercise his upper body. While people knew he was disabled, I can't say that they knew the full extent of the disability uh, because in, in the exhibit downstairs, the Action and Action Now exhibit about the first hundred days, you see these wonderful depictions in the political cartoons of the time that show FDR running and jumping and swimming and lifting and, and hiking and, and you know conquering things. Um, and so the public perception was that he was a true man of vigor, which he was, his legs just weren't very much used to him. One of the reasons Americans had this perception is the unique way he presented himself, both in the White House and in public. A simple thing such as a state dinner would be staged differently for FDR than it would be for, say, President Bush. Whereas today, state dinners, all the guests are seated and the president then comes in. In FDR's time, FDR was already seated at the table and the wheelchair and any portable ramps were removed. So that when people came in, they went to the president to greet him, they didn't have to see him coming in uh, in a wheelchair and down a ramp. Same if you had a meeting with him in an office and you weren't a close intimate of his, he would already be seated at his desk or in the easy chair in the Oval Office and you would go to him to greet him rather than, uh, than him standing up to welcome you to the office. You are looking at the only three known photographs of Franklin Roosevelt in his wheelchair, all taken by close family members or friends, none by the press. So how is it possible that in all those years they didn't take any pictures of him like this? This was a pre-Watergate press who, um, who also were suffering from the effects of the Depression and who also were involved in the war. Um, and so they understood what FDR was trying to accomplish. And so when, when FDR and his aides and the Secret Service requested that the press not take photographs of FDR um, in his wheelchair or in vulnerable positions, for example, being lifted in and out of a, of a car, by a Secret Service agent or walking in his very halting steps up a ramp, the press um, you know, very much complied with that. Roosevelt only mentioned the fact that he couldn't walk publicly once. When he returned from the Yalta Conference in 1945 and he did the very unusual thing of actually sitting down before Congress when he addressed a joint session. Um, he, he said that you'll have to forgive me for sitting down, but I just returned from a very long trip and I have 10 pounds of steel around my legs. His intention was to get people to pay attention to the actions he was taking as well as the words he was speaking, which is one of the reasons why I think he was such a vigorous uh, public speaker, is he wanted people to pay attention to the words um, and not to the fact that he didn't have legs that worked. As I stand here today, having taken the solemn oath of office, in the presence of my fellow countrymen, in the presence of our God, I know that it is America's purpose that we shall not fail. Did you know Franklin Roosevelt had an assassination attempt on his life? It happened in Miami, where he was speaking to a large group while president-elect. He was in an open-topped car, 
the crowds were pushing in on him and surging in on him. Um, one of his Secret Service agents mentioned that you know this was a seemed kind of dangerous. FDR went on with it. Um, he pulled himself up to the top of the back seat of the car, spoke through a microphone for a few seconds, and as he slipped back down into the seat, five or six shots rang out. FDR was unharmed. However, the mayor of Chicago, who was traveling with the president, was mortally wounded. It was one of those moments in time, uh, one of those pivot points in time, that you're just not sure what would have happened to the country and the world had that shot been successful. But it really captured the imagination of the American people because they saw this as some type of divine intervention and some blessing on FDR and for his presidency. Franklin Roosevelt loved to collect things, particularly books. The FDR Presidential Library and Museum has over 21,000 volumes, including a shortened English version of Adolf Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, given to FDR in 1933. What the editors took out was the very rabid anti-Semitism and what you could argue is the foreshadowing of the final solution. FDR was so struck by what had been removed in this edition um, that he wrote the following. It was always his habit to sign his name and place where he had received the book and the year, but then he did something very unusual. He wrote, a, wrote an editorial comment. He said, this translation is so expurgated as to give a wholly false view of what Hitler really is or says. The German original would make a different story. Also in the library is the very last book Roosevelt read. And this is the, the paperback that he was reading the night, the night prior to his death. It's a Punch and Judy murder mystery by Carter Dixon. Um, and what's, what's truly fascinating is that when they cleared the bedside table the following day after FDR um, had passed, they found that he had turned his place down to a chapter called Six Feet of Earth, which is just one of those great stories that uh, you couldn't write yourself. We're one of the busiest research facilities in the whole presidential library system, and um, the questions that we receive run the, run the gamut, uh, everything from very esoteric topics about the war or a particular person's involvement in a, in a particular event to very kind of quirky questions. Um, uh, one example is that we received a request recently from an author who wanted to know when FDR and where, where FDR was conceived. And FDR was born on January 30th, 1882, and so this gentleman had calculated back to the time of conception being sometime between April, mid-April and mid-May of 1881, and he wanted to know if we knew where FDR's parents were at the time. Fortunately, we have uh, his mother Sarah's papers and her diaries, and we were able to narrow down that for that particular time period, FDR was either conceived in Paris or somewhere in Belgium. Um, so that, that's one of the more unusual requests that we've, we've gotten recently. Franklin Roosevelt is revered by so many because of how he led the country in times of national crisis, and also how he handled his own personal crisis. He overcame his disability through determination and hard work and seemed to celebrate this fact in 1933 when he returned to the place where the polio attacked his body. He had not been to Campobello since leaving there on a, on a cot or on a gurney, being lifted into a, into a train and being, able to, being unable to lift himself up. Um, so his return to Campobello was, was not only a vacation after a very vigorous 100 days in office, but really a triumphant return, essentially saying to the polio, I've conquered you, you haven't conquered me.